I'm delighted to have this opportunity to address you today as you celebrate 21 years at the vanguard of alternative dispute resolution in Africa. Unfortunately, due to scheduling conflicts, I'm not able to join you in person, but I hope to have the opportunity to do so before long. NCMG International has been a driver of legal change in Africa by promoting access to justice, peace building and conflict management. In so doing, you've been a key enabler of the economic growth of Africa. And I congratulate you on the very significant milestone of two decades of such success. A dozen years ago, Tom Friedman argued that the world is flattening as ideological shifts and technological advancements made the world a more interconnected place thus leveling the playing field for commerce. Such flattening has become increasingly pronounced since Friedman's book was published, with individuals and corporations able to access the world faster, further, deeper and cheaper than ever before. Transnational economic activity has reached unprecedented levels. Cross-border disputes too have assumed hitherto unseen levels of complexity. I suggest that in this setting, it is possible to discern three trends that simultaneously present opportunities for improving the way we dispense justice and threats that necessitate rethinking and retooling on our part if we are to remain relevant. First, the flattened world has created a populace that is knowledgeable about and comfortable with technology, increasingly aware of the law and ready to seek recourse if its rights are impugned. The average person today views adjudication as just another service, and he will increasingly expect it to be provided digitally, conveniently and expediently. Amidst the reality of limited court resources, we will need to innovatively leverage technology to meet these demands and serve our social purpose as the wider guarantors of legitimacy. Second, the world has been flattened largely due to exponential growth in computing power and the capacity to process information that has been made possible by this. This has and will continue to cause seismic shifts in the operations of the legal profession. Many of these developments will aid the work of judges. Some, however, will displace certain types of judicial work. We will need to stay abreast of these technological advancements to competently tackle the increasingly complex and document-intensive disputes of the future. Third, as the world continues to flatten and disputants demand faster and cheaper resolution of their disagreements, mediation has emerged as a crucial component of the dispute resolution landscape. Mediation challenges the conventional wisdom that cheap and good are mutually exclusive and gives disputants greater autonomy in resolving their disputes. But to take advantage of this reality, we need to rework our legislation and policies and to reconceive the role of our legal institutions. Sam Muller vividly distinguishes the average citizen who happens also to be the average consumer of judicial services of today and of the past in these terms. He says, the citizens of today are not the citizens of 20 years ago in a very fundamental way. There are now more e-people than a-people. Analog people want to fill in a form and send it by mail. They will physically go to court if asked. They readily navigate based on the advice of experts and they do not mind answering the same question a couple of times. E-people, on the other hand, abhor all this. They don't know what a paper form is. They do most of their business from wherever they are and whenever it suits them. They always Google before and while they're talking to experts 
and they hate answering a question more than once. Indeed, e-people want to log into an easy-to-use conflict resolution system. They don't really care whether it is national or international, public or private, as long as it works. Singapore has, since 1997, implemented an electronic filing system for court documents that is accessible over the internet. This has since developed into an electronic case management system where both lawyers and court staff can upload and retrieve case documents. We've also introduced technology courts for use in cases where technology can facilitate the presentation of evidence and promote efficiency in the hearing process. Most recently, in 2015, we launched a Sentencing Information and Research Repository to collate and enable access to information about outcomes in past cases, thereby enhancing consistency and transparency in sentencing. Going forward, we're studying various innovative technology initiatives used or being developed by the judiciaries of other countries for their possible adoption in Singapore. Let me mention three of these. First, electronic trials. In May 2014, judges from the United Kingdom, United States and New Zealand participated in a pilot e-trial where they used video technology to oversee a trial and separate screens to view case documents. The physical attendance of parties and their witnesses in a courtroom was dispensed with, while the need to print, store and transport physical case documents was obviated. Second, electronic pleas of guilt. In Queensland, Australia, a person charged with a minor offence in a magistrate's court can plead guilty online. The guilty plea will be read out in court and the case will then be dealt with. The person need not appear in a court unless more information happens to be required from him. Third, real-time digital transcription. Several law firms in the United States and Canada have used fully digital real-time transcription for dictation, effectively producing immediate transcripts without human input. Given how far and how rapidly transcription technology has advanced, we will soon see fully digital real-time transcription of court proceedings that is faster, cheaper and more accurate than the work of any human court reporter. The benefits offered by these technological advancements are manifold. Most obviously, they reduce the need for human attendance of parties, lawyers, judges and such court staff as stenographers in physical courtrooms. This offers much savings in time and costs particularly in terms of transport to and from the courtroom. Moreover, the ensuing reliance on digital documents generates savings in terms of the cost of printing, storing and transporting physical documents and facilities information sharing between the court and the parties. This is especially useful when there are multiple parties involved where the use of electronic documents helps ensure that each party is literally on the same page as the trial progresses. Finally, the creation of an electronic trial record in real time potentially improves advocacy by increasing the responsiveness of the court and of counsel to evidence and arguments and facilitates the speedy assembly of a trial record for the purposes of the appeal which can prove critical in cases where time is of the essence. We need to embrace these developments and to leverage on them to improve both the quality of justice that we deliver and the process of dispute resolution that court users experience. In 1965, Gordon Moore, the co-founder of Intel, predicted that the processing power of computers would double every two years or so. Amazingly, his prediction has come to pass and continues to hold strong. 
If it continues unabated, by 2020, an average desktop computer will have similar processing power to a human brain. And by 2050, $1,000 of computing will exceed the processing power of all human brains on the Earth. This has produced computers that are increasingly capable of performing tasks that were once thought to be the exclusive preserve of human beings. Specifically, computers can process vast quantities of information which would overwhelm the human mind to distill patterns and insights that can then be used to make accurate predictions in a way that mimics human intelligence. This is artificial intelligence, or AI. AI has been used to analyze databases of precedents to predict the outcomes of cases. And the system can even be taught to take account of such variables as the ruling history of the judge who will likely hear the case. The software Lex Machina trawls through the internet for data from all known sources of patent law, uploads the data into a master database, and then predicts how a new patent will fare based on the data collated. The Lexis MedMal Navigator operates similarly in the context of medical malpractice to advise lawyers on whether a potential medical malpractice claim is worth taking on. And the verdict and settlement analyzer trawls through case law to advise lawyers on whether a motion will be approved or denied. Computers are increasingly being used to classify documents in a database based on whether they meet specified criteria. This has been described as Technology Assisted Review of Documents, or TAR. In e-discovery, TAR is typically used to identify documents that are responsive to a particular request for production or to identify documents that are subject to privilege or work, work product protection. Traditionally, lawyers have used keyword searches to locate the relevant documents. But keyword searches work well only in clean databases like Westlaw and Lexis that contain complete sentences and full words rather than abbreviations and are ill-suited to collections of emails which tend to be informal and rampant with misspellings, abbreviations and acronyms. The latest developments in TAR involve a system that uses learning algorithms to analyze a sample of documents, identify the characteristics that make a document relevant or irrelevant, develop rules according to these characteristics, and then apply the rules to determine the relevance of new documents that it encounters. With the computing power that is available today, TAR can now equal or exceed the effectiveness of human review and it can eliminate much of the manpower costs associated with discovery. Unsurprisingly, TAR has been gaining prominence in litigation and has received judicial endorsement by the courts in the United Kingdom and the United States. Other AI-based problem-solving tools have also ventured into the legal field. For example, IBM's Watson, famous for its participation in the American TV quiz show Jeopardy, has since evidently gone to law school. IBM's Watson can now understand complex questions put to it in natural language, look through a vast database of stored documents, draw conclusions and offer solutions in natural language. Another service provider called Ross Intelligence builds on IBM's Watson to help lawyers do legal research. Lawyers can ask Ross legal questions in plain language, and Ross promises to read through the entire body of law and return a cited answer and topical readings from legislation, case law, and secondary sources. Dentons, the world's largest law firm, has recently signed a deal with Ross Intelligence. Litigation lawyers handling document-intensive, complex commercial disputes 
will soon use AI and its autonomous insight distillation capabilities to see through mounds of paper, identify relevant documents, and then extract from these documents trends and insights to inform and enrich the case theories that they will run before judges. These technological advances will sustain rather than disrupt the work of judges. But it follows that courts must invest in these services to continue to manage effectively complex commercial cases. Let me turn to the third of the trends I have spoken of, mediation. At the heart of the rule of law is access to justice. The ability of a disputant to avail himself of the justice system to vindicate his interests. However, the realities of the justice system include restricted amounts of court time, technical procedures, rising and often unaffordable litigation costs, and delays. Mediation offers an invaluable tool to address the needs, interests, and rights of disputants amidst these structural constraints. Mediation is relatively free of formality and technicality and eschews the adversarial fault-finding associated with litigation. It focuses on the needs and interests of the parties and on resolving the problems between them and grants them relative freedom in participating in the problem-solving process. This offers three primary benefits. First, mediation is an especially accessible mode of dispute resolution. Second, it entails considerably less expenditure on trial preparation, lawyers, experts, and the other outgoings traditionally associated with litigation. Third, the involvement of the parties in the problem-solving process makes it easier for them to accept the outcome of the dispute. In some, disputants pay less money over a shorter period of time for a better outcome. The statistics paint an encouraging picture of the success of mediation. The Citizens Mediation Center in Lagos, Nigeria has been a resounding success resolving 46% of its cases in 2012-2013 and 54% in 2014-2015, despite a 40% jump in the number of cases handled between the two periods. So successful has been the Citizens Mediation Center model that it has been replicated and extended in 16 states. Similarly, in the Singapore Supreme Court, the rate of settlement for cases which proceeded to mediation in recent years has ranged between 66% and 81%. Admittedly, the growth of mediation has raised concerns about the informalization of dispute resolution and the loss of judicial precedence with their norm-setting functions. I would suggest, however, that mediation and adjudication are complementary dispute resolution mechanisms. A disputant invariably attempts mediation with some understanding of its established legal rights and obligations, and an expectation of how the dispute might be adjudicated. Having a more diversified suite of dispute resolution options therefore enhances the ability of the legal system to deliver justice that is tailored to the particularities of each case, reinforcing its overall legitimacy. This in turn fosters respect for the norms that are set within the adjudicative process. This complementarity is exemplified by the NCMG spearheaded multi-door courthouse scheme, which has been so successful that a multi-door courthouse law has been enacted to give statutory backing to the scheme. And in 2012, the relevant procedural rules were revised to have all cases before the Lagos High Court 
evaluate it for suitability for referral to the Lagos multi-door courthouse. Likewise, in Singapore, after the state courts started automatic referrals of low-value civil claims to mediation, neutral evaluation or arbitration unless parties elected otherwise, user satisfaction rates increased from 92% in 2013 to 96% in 2015. The family justice system in Singapore has enjoyed particular success in using mediation as a complement to adjudication. In 2014, with a view to preserving familial relationships beyond the court process, mediation was made mandatory as part of divorce proceedings for parties with children under the age of 21. Since then, mediation has been a key instrument of the family justice courts by offering a safe and supportive environment in which the parties can communicate openly and explore mutually acceptable solutions. It encourages them to compromise and then adhere to the settlements reached by consensus. Mediation therefore helps disputants to exit the court proceedings without further damaging their already strained relationships. I want to touch finally on Online Dispute Resolution, or ODR, which allies the conciliatory problem-solving feature of mediation with the autonomous insight distillation of AI and which will likely become the dominant way of resolving all but the most complex and high-value disputes. ODR was inspired by the automated dispute resolution tools adopted by e-commerce sites such as eBay, which settles upwards of 60 million claims a year. In the Netherlands, the Rectwiser platform currently processes about 700 divorces each year, with guided questionnaires that allow the parties to manage the divorce process and desired outcome in their own home, using their own words, and at their own pace. The use of ODR platforms reduces the potential for confrontation compared to traditional face-to-face -face dispute resolution methods, and it helps with the expeditious disposal of straightforward and routine disputes up front, thereby freeing up more judicial time and resources to be allocated to the resolution of more complex disputes. These are exciting times for those of us involved in the legal profession as the tide of technology finally reaches our shores. We should not fear it. Instead, we must embrace and use the capabilities to dramatically enhance our ability to fulfill our calling to administer justice. And we should also recognize the reality that justice can often be administered more effectively through other methods of dispute resolution, such as mediation. Let me conclude this address by congratulating you once again on the last 20 years when you have been at the forefront of peace building and access to justice in Africa. I wish you the very best for this conference and every success as you implement reforms in your dispute resolution framework and endeavor to take it to greater heights. And as I said at the outset, I look forward to joining you in person before long. Thank you.